Good morning, day 15, Gene Tuma Kane. Gene Tuma's grandfather was Pinckney Benton Stewart Pinchback, who was born free black, a union officer in the Civil War, and was elected to the office of Lieutenant Governor and was acting governor of the state of Louisiana during Reconstruction. When Governor Pinchback retired north, he settled his family in a community of the capital, Washington, D.C. Thus, Tuma was born as Nathan Pinchback Tuma into an upper-class Negro family in Washington, D.C. on December 26, 1894. The Tuma family was not typical of migrating African-American settling or in the north of Florida, uh, South. Each of Gene Tuma's maternal grandparents were of a Caucasian father, but a speck of black makes you black. Now we're going to be reading Cain, an excerpt of Cain that was published in, let me see, hold on for a second, 1920. 1923, I believe. Let's see. Yes. Published in 1923. Jean Tumor was a very high figure, uh, very, very well known in the Harlem Renaissance. Jean could have passed for white, but he didn't. Kane. Kathritha. Karitha. Karintha. Karintha. Carintha, her skin is like dust on, an, on the eastern horizon. Oh, can't you see it? Oh, can't you see it? Her skin is like dust on the eastern horizon when the sun goes down. Men have always wanted her, this Caritha. Even as a child, Caritha carried beauty perfect as dust when the sun goes down. Old men rode her hobby horse upon their knees. Young men dance with her at frolics when they should have been dancing with their grown-up girls. God grant us you secretly prayed the old men. The young fellows counted the time to pass before she would be old enough to mate with them. This interest of the male who wishes to ripen a growing thing too soon could mean no good to her. Carintha at, at 12 was a wild flash that told the other folks what just what it was to live. A sunset when there was no wind and the pine smoke from over by the sawmill hugged the earth and you couldn't see more than a few feet in front. Her sudden dots darting past you was a bit of vivid color, like a blackbird that flashes in light. With the other children, one could hear some distance off, their feet flopping in the two-inch dust. Caritha's running was a whirl. It had the sound of the red dust that sometimes make it, makes a spiral in the road. At dusk, during the hush, just after the sawmill had closed down and before any of the women had started their supper getting ready songs, her voice, high-pitched, shrill, put one's ears to itching, but no one ever thought to make her stop because of it. She stoned the cows and beat her dog and fought other children. Even the preacher who caught her at mischief told himself that she was as innocently lovely as a November cotton flower. Already, already rumors were out about her. Homes in Georgia are almost often built on the two-room plan, and one you cook and eat, and in the other you sleep, and their love goes on. Caritha had seen or heard, perhaps she had felt her parents loving. One could imitate one's parents, for to follow them was the way of God. She played home with a small boy who was not afraid to do her bidding. That started the whole thing. Old men could no longer ride her hobby horse upon their knees, but young men counted faster. Her skin is like dust, oh, can't you see it? Her skin is like dust when the 
sun goes down. Caritha is a woman. She carries beauty perfect dust when the sun goes down. She has been married many times. All men remind her that a few years back they rode her hobby horse upon their knees. Caritha smiles and indulges them when she is in the mood for it. She has contempt for them. Caritha is a woman. Young men run stills to make her money. Young men go to big cities and run on the road. Young men go away to college. They all want to bring her money. These are the young men who thought that all they had to do was to count time. But Caritha is a woman and she has, a, she has had a child. A child fell out of her womb onto a bed of pine needles in the forest. Pine needles are, sm are smooth and sweet. They are elastic to the feet of rabbits. A sawmill was nearby. Its um, pyramidal sawdust pile smote it. It is a year before one completely burns. Meanwhile, the smoke curls up and hangs in hard rafts around the trees, curls up and spreads itself out over the valley. Weeks after Caritha returned home, the smoke, the smoke was so heavy you tasted it in the water. Same one made a song, smoke is on the hills. Rise up, smoke is on the hill. Oh, rise and take my soul to Jesus. Caritha is a woman. Men do not know that the soul of her was a growing thing ripened too soon. They will bring their money. They will not. They will die not having found it out. Caritha at 20 carrying beauty, perfect as dust when the sun goes down. Caritha, her skin is like dusk on an eastern horizon. Oh, can't you see it? Oh, can't you see it? Her skin is like the dust on the eastern horizon. When the sun goes down, goes down. Reapers. Black reapers with the sound of steel on stones are sharpening schnicks. I see them place the hones in their hip pockets as a thing that's done and start their silent swinging. One by one, black horses drive a mower through the weeds and there a field rat startled, squealing bleeds. His, buddy, his, his belly close to the ground. I see the blade, blood stain continuing, cutting weeds and shade. November cotton flower. But weavers coming in the winter's cold, make cotton stalks look rusty seasons old, and cotton scarce as any southern snow was vanishing, the brand so pinched and slow, failed in its function as the autumn rake. Draw fighting soil has caused the soul to take all water from the streams dead birds were found in wells a hundred feet below the ground. Such was the season when the flower bloomed. Old folks were startled and it soon assumed significant superstition saw something it had never seen before. Brown eyes that loved without a trace of fear, beauty so sudden for that time of year. Becky. Becky was a white woman who had two Negro sons. She's dead, they've gone away. The pine whispers to Jesus. The Bible flaps its leaves with an aimless rustle on her mount. Becky had one Negro son who gave it to her. Damn buck nigger said the white folks mouth. She couldn't tell, she wouldn't tell. Calm and God forsaken, insane, white, shameless wrench, said the white folk's mouth. Her eyes were sunken, her neck was stringy, her breast falling. Till then, taking their words, they filled her like a bubble rising. Then she broke, mouth settling, setting in a twist that held her eyes harsh, vacant, staring. Who gave it to her? Low down nigger with no respect, said the black folk's mouth. She wouldn't tell. Poor Catholic, poor white crazy woman, said the black folks' mouth. White folks and black folks built her cabin, fed her and her growing baby, prayed secretly to God who put his cross upon her and cast her out. When the first was born, the white folks said that they'd have no more to do with her and black folks, they two joined hands to cast her out. 
the pines whispered to Jesus, the railroad boss said not, said not to say he said it, but she could live if she wanted to on the narrow strip of land between the railroad and the road. John Stone, who owned the lumber and the bricks, would have shot the man who told he gave the stuff to Lonnie Deacon, who stole there at night and built the cabin, a single room held down to earth, or fly away to Jesus by a leaning chimney. Six trains each day rumbled past and shook the ground under her cabin fords and huge horse and mule drawn buggies went back and forth along the road. No one ever saw her. Trainmen and passengers who heard about her threw out papers and food. They threw out little crumpled slips of paper scribbled with prayers as they passed her eye shaped piece of sandy ground. Ground islandized between the road and railroad track, pushed up where blue sheen God with listless eyes could look at it. Folks from the town took turns unknown, of course, to each other in bringing corn and meat and sweet potatoes, even sometimes snuff. Oh, thank you, Jesus, oh, David, George, Georgia, grinding cane and boiling syrup, never went away without some sugar sap. No one ever saw her. The boy grew and ran around. When he was five years old, as folks reckoned it, Hugh Jordan saw him carrying a baby. Becky has another son. Was what was what the whole town knew. But nothing was said for the part of man that says things to the like of that have told itself that if there was a Becky, that Becky now was dead. The two boys grew sullen and cunning. Old Pines whispered to Jesus, tell him to come and press sweet Jesus' lips against their lips and eyes. It seemed as though with those two fellas, big fellas there, there could be no room for Becky. The part that prayed wondered if perhaps she really died or they had buried her. No one dared ask. They beat and cut a man who meant nothing at all in mentioning that they lived along the road, white or colored, no one knew, and least of all themselves. They drifted around from job to job. We who cast them, cast out their mother because of them could take them in. They answered black and white folks by shooting up two men and leaving town. God damn the white folks, God damn the niggers, they shouted as they left town. Becky, smoke curled up from a chimney. She must be there. Trains passed and shook the ground, the ground shook the leaning chimney. Nobody noticed it. A creepy feeling came over all who saw that thin wraith of smoke and felt the trembling of the ground. Folks began to take her food again. They quit as soon because they had a fear. Becky, if dead, might be a haunt, and if alive, it took some nerve even to mention it. Old Pines whispered to Jesus. It was Sunday. A congregation had been visiting at Pulverton and were coming home. There was no wind, the autumn sun, the bell from Appenezer Church, listless and heavy. Even the pines were stale and sticky like the smell of food that makes you sick. Before we turned the bend of the road that would show us Becky cabin, the horses stopped stock still, pushed back their ears and nervously whinnied. We urged them, then whipped them on. Quarter of a mile away, thin smoke curled up from the leaning chimney. Old pines whispered to Jesus. Goose flesh came on my skin, though it, there still was neither chill nor wind. Eyes left their sockets for the cabin. Ears burnt and throbbed, uncanny eclipse. Fear closed my mind. We were just about to pass. Pine shouted to Jesus. The ground trembled as the ghost train rumbled by. The chimney fell into the cabin. Its thud was like a hollow report. Ages haven't passed since it went off. Bottle and I were pulled out of our seats, dragged to the door that swung open. Through the dust we saw the bricks in a mound upon the floor. Becky, if she was there, laid under them. I thought I heard a groan, Barlow, mumbling something through his Bible on the pile. No one has ever touched it. Somehow we got away. My buggy was still on the road. Last thing I remember was whipping old Dan like fury. 
I remember nothing after that, and that is until I reach town and folks crowd around to get the true word of it. Becky was a white woman who had two Negro sons. She's dead, they've gone away. The pines whisper to Jesus. The Bible flaps his leaves with aimless rustle on her mount. Face. Hair silver gray like streams of stars. Bow bro, bro, um, bros. Recurved canoes quivered by the ripple blown by pain. Her eyes, a mist of tears, condescending on the flesh below, and her channeled muscles are clustered grapes of sorrow. Purple in the evening sun, nearly ripe for worms. Cotton song. Come, brother, come, let's lift it. Come now, hear it, roll away. Shackles fall upon the judgment day. But let's not wait for it. God's body got a soul. Bodies like to roll a soul. Can't blame God if we don't roll. Come, brother, roll, roll. Cotton bales a fleecely way. Weary sinners bare feet trod. Slowly, softly, softly to the throne of God. We ain't again till, wait until the judgment day. Nessa, nessa, hump. Echo, echo, roll away. We ain't again waiting till under the judgment day. God's body got a soul. Bodies like to roll the soul. Can't blame God if we don't roll. Come, brother, roll, roll. Karma. Winners in the cane, come along. Cane leaves swaying, rusty with talk. Scratching choruses above the guineas squawk. When is the cane come along? Karma in overhauls as strong as any man stands behind the old brown mule driving the wagons home. It bumps and groans and shakes as it crosses the railroad tracks. She's riding it easy. I leave the men around the stove to follow her with my eyes down the red dust road. Nigga woman driving a Georgia chariot down that old dust road. Dixie Pike is what they call it. Maybe she feels my gaze. Perhaps she expects it any way she turns. The sun, which has been slanting over her shoulder, shoots primitive rockets into a mangrove gloomed yellow flower face. Hey, yip, God has left the Moses people for the nigger. Giddy up. Using reins to slap the mule, she disappears in a cloudy rumble at some indefinite point along the road. The sun is hammered to a band of gold. Pine needles like monster are brilliantly aglow. No rain has come to take the rustle from the falling sweet gum leaves. Over in the forest across the swamp, a sawmill blows its closing whistle. Smoke curls up, marvelous web spun by the spider sawdust pile. Curls up and spreads itself pine high above the branch, a single silver band along the eastern valley. A black boy, you are the most sleepiest man I ever seed. Sleeping beauty cradled on a gray mule, guided by the hollow sound of cowbells, headed for them through the rusty cotton field. From down the railroad track, the chug chug of a gas engine announces that the red Repair gang is coming home. A girl in the yard of the of a white whitewashed shack is not much larger than the stack of worn tiles piled before it sings. Her voice is loud, echoes like rain, sweeps the valley, dust takes the polish from the rails. Light twinkles in the scattered houses from far away, a sad strong song, pungent and composite. The smell of farmyards is the fragrance of the woman. She does not sing. Her body is a song. She is in the forest dancing. Torches flare, juju men. Geechee, geechee. Witch doctors' torches go out. The Dixie Pike has grown from a goat path in Africa night. Foxy the bitch slips back her ears and barks at the rising moon. Wind is in the cane, come along. Cane leaves swaying rusty with talk, scratching choruses above the guinea squawk. Winners in the cane come along.
Carmen's tale is the cruelest melodrama. Her husband's in the gang, and it's her fault he got there. Working with a contractor, he was away most of the time. She had others. No one blames her for that. He returned one day and hung around town, where he picked up weak old bus boasts and rumors. Bain accused her she denied. She couldn't see that she was becoming, he couldn't see that she was becoming hysterical. She would have liked to take his fist and beat her. Who was strong as a man stronger, words like corkscrews, wormed to his strength and fizzled out. Grabbing a gun, she rushed from the house and plunged across the road into a cane break. There in a quarter heaven shone the crescent moon. Bane was afraid to follow till he heard the gun go off. Then he wasted a half an hour gathering the neighbor men. They met in the road where lamplight showed tracks dissolving in the loose earth about the cane. The search began. Moths flickered the lamps. They put them out, really because she still might be alive enough to shoot. Time and space have no meaning in the cane field no more than interminable stalks. Some, someone stumbled over her, a cry went out. From the road, one would have thought they were cornering a rabbit or a skunk. It's difficult carrying dead weight through cane. They placed her on the sofa. A curious, nosy somebody looked for the wound. This, this fussing with her clothes aroused her. Her eyes were weak and pitiable as strong a woman. Slowly then, like a flash, Bane came to know that the shot she fired with averted head was aimed to whistle like a dying hornet through the cane. Twice deceived and one deception proved the other. His head went off, slashed one of the men who helped. The man who stumbled over her, and now he's in the gang. Who was her husband? Should she not take others as common? Strong as a man whose tale I have told is the cruelest Melodrama. Wind is in the cane. Come along. Cane leaves swaying rusty with talk. Scratching choruses above the guinea squawk. Wind is in the cane. Come along. Song of the sun. Pour, pour that parting soul in song. Oh, pour it in the sawdust glow of the night. Into the velvet pine smoke air tonight. And let the valley carry it along and let the valley carry it along. O oh, land and soil, red soil and sweet gum tree, so scant of grass, so profligate, uh, profligate, no, profligate of pines, just before an Epcot sun declines. Thine sun in time I have returned to thee, thy sun I have in time returned to thee, in time for though the sun is setting on, a sunlight race of slaves is not yet set, though late old soul is not yet, it's not too late yet, to catch that plaintive soul leaving soon gone, leaving to catch thy plaintive soul soon gone. O oh, Negro slaves, dark purple ripened plums, squeezed and bursting in the pinewood air, passing before they stripped the old tree bare, one plum was saved for me. One seed becomes an everlasting song, a singing tree, curling softly souls of slavery. What were they and what are they to me, curling softly souls of slavery? Georgia dusk, the, slave, the sky lazily disdaining to pursue, the setting sun endowing to hold a lengthened tournament for flashing gold, passively darkens for night's barbecue. A feast of moon and men and barking hounds, a orgy for some genius of the South, with blood eye, blood hot eyes and cane lipped scented mouth, surprised in making folk songs from soul sounds. The sawmill blows its whistle. Buzz saw a stop and silence breaks the bud of Nolan Hill, soft set in pollen where plowed lands fulfill their early promise of a bumper crop. Smoke from the Permado sawdust pile curls up, blue smokes, blue ghosts of trees tarrying low where only chips and stumps are left to show the solid proof of a former domicile. Meanwhile, the men with vestiges of pomp race memories of king and caravan, high priest and ostrich and a juju man 
go singing through the footprints, footpaths of the swamp. Their voices rise, they see the pine needles are guitars strumming pine needles like the sheets of rain. Their voices rise, the chorus of the king is curling a vasper to the stars. Oh, singers ravenous and soft your sounds above the sacred whisper of the pines. Give virgin lips to corn field concubines, bringing dreams of Christ to dusky, dusky, cane lip frogs, fern. Face flowed into her eyes, flowed in soft cream foam and plaintive nip ripples in such a way that wherever you glance may momentarily have rested and immediately thereafter wavered in the direction of her eyes. The soft suggestion of down slightly darkened like the shadow of a bird's wing might the creamy brown color of her upper lip. Why, after noticing it, you saw her eyes. I cannot tell you. Her nose was aquiline, semitic. If you ever, if you ever heard a Jewish cantor sing, if he has touched you and made your own sorrow seem trivial, when compared with his, you would know my feelings when I follow the curves of her profile, like mobile rivers to their common delta. There were strange eyes. In this, they saw nothing. That is nothing that is obvious and tangible and that one could see, and they gave the impression that nothing was to be denied. When a woman seeks, you have to be observed. Her eyes denied. Fern's eyes desired nothing, but you could give her. There was no reason why they should withhold. Men saw her eyes and fooled themselves. Fern's eyes said to them that she was easy. When she was young, a few men took her, but got no joy from it. And then once done, they fell bound to her, quite unlike that their hit and run with other gals. Felt as though it would take them a lifetime to fulfill an obligation which they could find no name for. They became attached to her and hungered after finding the barest trace of what she might desire. As she grew up, new men who came to town felt as felt as felt as almost everyone did who ever saw her that they would not be denied. Men were everlastingly bringing her their bodies. Something inside of her got tired of them, I guess, for I'm certain that for the life of her, she could not tell why or how she began to turn them off. A man in fever is no trifling thing to send away. They began to leave her baffled and ashamed, yet vowing to themselves that some day they would do some fine thing for her, send her candy every week and not let her know where it came from, watch out for her wedding day and give her a magnificent something with no name on it, buy a house and deed it to her, rescue her from some unworthy fellow who had tricked her into marrying him. As you know, men are apt to idolize or fear that which they cannot understand, especially if it be a woman. She did not deny them, yet the fact was that they were denied. A sort of superstition crept into their consciousness of her being somehow above them. Being above them meant that she was not to be approached by anyone. She became a virgin. Now a virgin in a small southern town is by no means the usual thing, if you, if you will believe me. That the sexes were made to mate is the practice of the South. Particularly black folks were made to mate. And it is black folks whom I've been talking about thus far. White mate, what white men thought of Fern I can arrive at only by analogy. They let her alone. Anyone, of course, could see could see her, could see her eyes. If you walked up Dixie Pike almost any time of the day, you'd most like to see her resting listless like on a on the railing of a porch, back propped up against a po post, head tilted a little forward because there was a nail in the porch post just where her head came, which for some reason or other she never took the trouble to pull out. Her eyes if if it were a sunset rested idly where the sun, molten and glorious, was pouring down between the fringes of pine, or maybe they gazed at the gray cabin on the knoll from which an evening folk song was coming. 
Perhaps they followed a cow that had been turned loose to roam and feed on cotton stalks and corn leaves. Like, like as not, they settled on some vague spot above the horizon, though hardly a trace of wistfulness would come to them. If it were dust, then they'd wait for a searchlight of the evening train, which you could see miles up the track before it fled across Dixie Pike, close to her home, wherever they looked, you'd follow them and they'd wave her back. Like her face, the whole countryside seemed to flow into her eyes, flowed into them with soft listless cadence of Georgia South. A young Negro once was looking at hell, her spellbound from the road, a white man passing in a buggy had to flick him with a whip if he was to get by without running him over. I first saw her on the porch. I was passing with a fellow whose crusty numbness I was up from the north and suspected of being prejudiced and stuck up was melting as he found me warm. I asked him who she was. That fern was all that I could get from him. Some folks already thought that I was given to nosing around. I let it go at that, so far as questions were concerned. But at first sight of her, I felt as if I heard a Jewish cantor song, as if it's as if his singing rose above the unheard, unheard chorus of a folk song, and I felt bound to her. I too had many dreams, something I would do for her. I have knocked about from town to town, too much not to fully know the fertility of mere change of place. Besides, picture, if you can, this cream-colored solitary girl sitting at a tenement window looking down on in different throngs of Harlem. Better that she listened to folk songs at dusk in Georgia. You would say, and so I would, or suppose she came up north and married, even a doctor or a lawyer say one was sure to get along that is make money you and i know you have that experience in such things that love is not a thing like prejudice which can be bettered by the changes of time could men in washington and chicago or new york more than men of georgia bring her something left vacant by the bestowal of their bodies you and i know men in these cities will have to say they could not See her out and out a prostitute along State Street in Chicago. See her move into a southern town where white men are more aggressive. See her become a white man's concubine. Something I must do for her. There was myself. What could I do for her? Talk, of course. Put back the fringes of pines upon new horizons. What to what purpose and what for her? Myself? Men in her case seemed to lose their self selfishness. I lost mine before I touched her. I ask you, friend, it makes no difference if you sit in the Pullman or the Jim Crow as the train crosses her road. What thoughts would come to you, that is, after you finished with the thoughts that leap into men's mind at the sight of a pretty woman who will not deny them? What thoughts will come to you? Have you seen her in a quick flash, keen and intuitively as she sat down on her porch where the train thundered by? Would you have gotten off at the next station and come back for her to take her where? Would you have completely forgotten her as soon as you reached Macon, Atlanta, Augusta, Pasadena, Mass Madison, Chicago, Boston, or New Orleans? Would you tell your wife or sweetheart about a girl you saw your thoughts can help me, and I would like to know something I would do for her. And that's the end of the excerpt of Cain by Jean Toma. Have a great day.